Well, good morning, everyone. Um, so, we have the first two plenaries this morning, and they're a little uh, bit uh, focused on human dimensions. And the first one is by Ma Mark Roundsaval at the University of Edinburgh, and he is our new co-chair of the, uh, the Human Dimensions Focus uh, Research Group. So, with that, I invite Mark to come up. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to explain in a moment what the title actually means, but I'm going to start with the immortal quote from Monty Python. And now for something completely different. So I've been uh, listening very carefully to the talks that I've heard so far here. What you're going to hear from me is really quite different from what you've heard from the other people so far. Because I'm going to be talking about people. People and society, the societies within which people operate. I, we have a whole set of ways of thinking about how we understand how people contribute to the Earth system. And I'm going to be giving you some examples of how we try to model people and societies. The title said integrated modeling. So, again, I'm going to give you some examples of this, but it means different things. It means integration across natural and human science disciplines, and that's absolutely crucial. So we're really de dealing within a, a multidisciplinary perspective. It's uh, integration across areas of human endeavor, different social economic sectors, which again we have to account for when looking at human systems. It's also, though, and again, this is really crucial for understanding people, it's integration across spatial scales. And I'm going to be giving you some examples from the global right down to the, the local scale of, of human dimensions modeling. But it's also integration across multiple global change drivers. So the theme of this uh, meeting is climate change, which of course is an incredibly important topic. But we can only think of climate change within the context of a wide range of different social economic change drivers. And that's crucial in terms of understanding the human dimensions aspects. So I'm going to give you examples today, which are really drawn mostly from the land and water resource sectors, mostly looking at the topic of land use and land cover change, because it's one of the areas where uh, this integration across the biophysical and human dimension sciences has, has progressed the most, in my opinion. Okay, so the human dimensions of the Earth system. We know that human actions impact on the Earth system and change in the Earth system. That's what climate change is all about. Climate change is about people. We are the cause of climate change, and we may or may not find solutions to the problem of climate change. So we impact on the Earth system in many different ways. But we're also highly responsive as individuals and, and societies to changes in the Earth system itself. And an important component of, of uh, human dimensions modeling is trying to understand those responses. How do individuals and societies respond to a changing environment around us? So we have this sort of dual set of impacts uh, between human systems and the broader Earth system. So the big question is always, can we model human processes? Now I'm often asked or given statements by my colleagues who are physicists engaged in um, modeling physical components of the Earth system, they say, how the hell can you model people? You know, that's not random beings that just make things up as they go along. There's no basic laws or theories or anything like this. How do you model people? Well, actually, we can model people. It may be that we don't have a particularly well-developed understanding of the processes or the underlying theories. So when we think that people are behaving randomly, that probably just means that we don't understand really what underpins their decision making. So it's important to understand that human systems and interactions with the broader environment are reflected as a complex system, like the many other complex systems that all of you are working on. Um, but we can build models to try and understand more about how human systems operate and their role within the Earth system. And it's no different than all the things that you've been working on here. So the climate system, we know, is a complex system. We know that we can build models to do experiments to understand how the climate system works, and we can have a fairly good idea of, of the processes within the climate system. That doesn't mean we can predict uh, a tropical cyclone at any given moment in time, but we can understand the system quite well all the same. Cape tectonics, another example. We can understand the physics of that, we can understand the theories, we can build models. That doesn't mean we can predict earthquakes. 
And it's the same with human dimensions. We can try and build models and understand how human dimension systems operate and function, but we can never predict Donald Trump. Okay, let me start on the global scale. I'm just going to go from global right down to local and give you some examples of what's going on. One of the things you need to understand about human dimensions modeling is that there are many different paradigms and many different uh, theories and many different methods that are used in modeling different human systems. You're probably familiar that there's a lot of work on modeling done by economists. Well, economists have a very fixed view of the world. Uh, there's a lot of modeling that goes on in terms of uh, sociologists, for example, and psychologists. They have quite a different vision of how human dimensions operate. So you have to keep that in mind. So there is no sort of single set of models. If we did a review of uh, human dimensions models, I suspect there would be somewhere between 10 and 20 different, completely different paradigms of how you go about undertaking modeling. So I just want to give you some examples of some of those at these different scale levels. And scale is important because what you can represent in terms of human processes is really dependent upon the scale at which you're undertaking the study. So that's crucial to bear in mind. Right, so I'm going to start with... Um, a model called PLUM, the Pasolinus Land Use Model. This is a global scale model of the global agricultural system. I have to show you a picture with arrows and what have got boxes of found the words, uh, the relationships that are sort of modeled here. And again, you can see some of this relates to uh, the physical environment, how the crops respond to climate change, for example, in terms of yields, but also very much uh, the social side, you know, how do people, or how much uh, food do people consume, or their preferences for, do that, for doing that. So we're really looking at the supply side and the demand side as quasi-economic approaches to modeling uh, the global agricultural land use system. And the types of things we generate are maps like this. Okay? Um, fairly straightforward. So this is uh, a little bit old now. This is for the IPCC uh, escalator scenarios. So we're looking at problems modeled in the year 2000 for the baseline, projected forward to 2050 for the A2 mission scenario. And you can probably see, if you look carefully, that there are differences between the top map and the bottom map. That's good. Yeah? So we can model some of the changes that come about due to a whole range of scenarios scenario assumptions about how the climate will evolve, but also how socio-economic development trajectories will evolve as well. And both are important in contributing to the differences between those maps. And again, one of the reasons we try and do this in a spatial context is to understand the hot spots of change. So which parts of the world are under increasing pressures due to land use change under this set of scenario assumptions. But what's of interesting about doing modeling is to confront our models with observational information, uh, and from that we can learn something. So, as you can see from this graphic, this just shows the period 1990 to 2010. This is the cereal land area in thousand hectares for uh, different regions of the world. And what you can see is that the, uh, the little circles, the curves of the circles are the model simulation uh, outcomes, and the squares are observ observational data collected from the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO. And as you can see, that our model is fantastic, isn't it? It's really good. It's, doing good stuff. it's only 20 years, I'll give you that, but it's really good. I mean, that's not bad, actually, given the complexity and difficulties of modeling human systems at global scale levels. Really good. But let's, let's point out, you know, where, where's the difficulties here? You can see this one here doesn't quite work, does it? It always has to be a difficult one, doesn't it? Somewhere along the line. And, and, which, and it, oh, unfortunately, it's Russia. There we go. So Russia, Russia's being a bit difficult in this particular situation. Now, what's happening actually is really interesting because if you look at the time horizon here, we were unable to model uh, Russian serial land evolution over that period of time. You can see it's, it's significant that this graphic starts in the year 1990s. So this simply reflects uh, geopolitical changes that happened with the collapse of communism and the Soviet Union over that period of time. And we don't have that as a process in our models. Okay, so actually this is a good result. It would be a shame actually if we were able to replicate what's happened in Russia because we're not modeling those processes. So this is just a little warning that you know, when we think we've got some handle on how these systems are operating, there are always processes which we don't know uh, are going to have an influence. And the crucial thing there is, you know, even the CIA couldn't predict the collapse of the Soviet Union. So uh, how are we going to do that as modelers? We need to understand something better about the evolution of governance structures, the geopolitical structures, and how they reach tipping points, such as uh, these geopolitical collapses. And that's something which is fiendishly difficult uh, to model in practice. 
Right, this is a lovely table because you won't be able to read any of it. But I can take a look. So this is, um, I'll just show you one model which happens to be uh, one of my models. Uh, and it's great, as you've seen. But of course, we, we want to be uh, reflective in terms of how we look at how we model these types of systems across a wide range of different models. So what we did in this case, uh, this is a study where we did a, a land use change, a global land use change model into comparison exercise, just to try and understand what's going on out there. This just is a list of models. Actually, this is a list of models that operate at the global scale, but also the continental scale called uh, the continent of Europe. Uh, within this list, there are about a dozen global scale models that will model land use and land cover change as an outcome. Most of those are what are called integrated assessment models. These are models that are used uh, strongly by the climate change community in understanding the energy economy feedbacks to the climate system. So they're quite important models. They also model land use and land cover change, as you probably realize land use and land cover change is incredibly important in terms of impact on the climate system. It accounts for something like a third of the observed uh, climate change today compared to pre-industrial. So it's really important that we get the land use land cover right when, when we think about climate change. So there's a whole range of different models. So what we did is we, we took all these models into a wide range of different scenarios. Some of them were the, the old IPCC SLAS scenarios, but we've also got here a lot of more up-to-date SSP and RCP-based scenarios. If you're familiar with those, probably some of you are, some of you aren't. Uh, and we try to compare, we try to understand the purpose of this was not to say, oh, this is a great model, this is a bad model, although if you push me, I might just say that as well, but you know, that's, that's, for, that's not for public consumption, that's for afterwards. Um, it's not really to say this is good, this is bad, it's actually to understand why there are differences between them, right, and see where we are so we can learn to take things forward to the next step. So, um, this is the type of data we've got, let me just take you through this very quickly. We've aggregated the data up into very broad classes of land use land cover, to a propland, pasture and forest, look at the top graphics now. Uh, this shows the area of each of those uh, particular classes, in massive classes, and we're going through time in the future, so we're running from a multitude of scenarios. Now, if you look at the first one, it's Scotland, and you're getting exactly what you would expect, right? So these curves represent different individual models, which are listed in the legend at the bottom. Hopefully you can't see that, because otherwise you'd be trying to see which is good and which is bad. It just ignore that, it's just data for this purpose. And it's a range of different scenarios. So what you would expect is exactly what you see in the problem, which is this cone of, of uh, diversity as you go forward because there are different assumptions about how the world is evolving, including the effects of climate change. So that's great. Well, you can see that as you move on to passion, this is looking not quite so good here, is it, actually? <laughs> Something not quite right. And, and actually, oh, by the way, the, the black lines just show the observational data from the FAO, from the data I was showing you earlier, so that's just a reference point, right? And there's a data, so there's a model as well, so what we have to. So what you can see here, oh my gosh, so what we've got here is the initial starting positions for these curves. It's completely different. And actually, what you can see is uh, there's a smaller range of values at the end of the simulation period than there is at the beginning. Well, that's not good. So what's going on here is that there are two main things. First of all, it's the initial data that people use as inputs to their models, right? They have different starting points, and there's no accepted global data set of pasture land use. The second thing is, all of these modeling groups define pasture differently. They have different definitions. What is pasture? When is We've got a nice intensive grassland, that might be pasture, but when you start putting a few trees in it, you get into rangelands, and a few more trees, at which point is it a grassland, at which point is it a forest? So you have these real problems of uh, thematic definition, which really constrains what we can do. And you can see in this that this is an enormous source of uncertainty. And it's the same for forests, right? Again, yeah, there's no divergence. You want to see divergence across those range of scenarios, but it's not happening. The bottom curves just show when we've rebased We've removed that initial condition. We just rebased um, everything to the observational baseline in the year 2010. So again, you do get a little bit more of that diversity. But we have to keep in mind that when we're using any of these model outputs, and those initial conditions are really important. And we try to quantify this. And what we've taken are these raw data. We've done a sort of decomposition of their statistical study to try and break um, this down into what are the factors that explain that variability that we're seeing. We can have to try and show you this. We'll take this crop and pasture forest again. So what you can see here is the initial conditions in blue were what I was showing. So those are really important to start with. So this is the fraction of the variance explained by these different variables. But then we've also got, in green here, the model type. The model type is the, the, the paradigm that underpins, the philosophy that underpins the model, uh, as well as the resolution, the number of cells which are in a grid which is used for all of these models for simulation. 
And then we have the sort of ready colors here, which are the social economic scenarios. And finally, we have a representation of, of the climate inputs through the CO2 concentration, which is really important for these models because it affects uh, crop productivity. So, what you can see is if you start looking at problems to begin with, the green band, the model type, is incredibly important. The social economics are quite important, the climate change not very important at all. And when we move to pasture and forest, it's even worse situation. The initial conditions, as we saw from the original uh, graphs, were really crucial. The scenarios are really not much more important than the model type itself. So what we've got when we compare these models is that the differences between the models is probably at least as large as the differences between the assumptions in the scenarios. And that makes it very, very difficult to make any sensible, robust judgment about future projections of land use and land cover change. Really quite significant as, a, as an outcome of the study. And just to highlight that for you, Again, this is cropland areas through time in the future. You don't need to understand this graph. All you need to know from this is there are blue curves and there are orange curves. Right? You can see that, can't you? There are two curves. The blue curves are what are called partial equilibrium models. Uh, the orange curves are called general computable equilibrium models. They are both two styles of economics models, right? Just keeping within the economic community. These are just two ways in which economists model global land use change. And you can see there's a little bit of a stratification across those two models. So the model type is incredibly important, even for a range of scenarios, in determining this. It's really crucial for those of you involved in climate change studies. This is really quite significant because um, when you look at the IPCC and the way it reports on land use land cover change from the integrated assessment models, it's reporting the results from a single model for a single uh, SSP future scenario, right? Which is complete and utter nonsense, frankly, because all you're showing there is the difference between the models, not the difference between the SSP scenarios. Okay. Okay, so a few key messages. The global study is great divergence uh, in human processes, and the indication is that we're not actually doing very well at modeling global land use land cover change, the human dimensions at this moment in time. Right, so we'll come down and we're going to continental European scale now, uh, and just give you some other uh, ideas about how we model. So now we're, we're looking really at what I would call a regional integrated assessment model as opposed to a global integrated assessment model. Similar kinds of paradigms, but uh, much greater possibility to include more refined data sets as inputs and a, and a wider range of processes that can be uh, parameterized at that level. What's important actually when you get down to these levels is the interaction between different sectors. Right? We know that water resources are highly dependent upon what's happening with urban land use change or with agriculture. We know that biodiversity depends explicitly on urban growth, on the availability of water resources, on agricultural management and a whole range of things. And in many, many cases, this is overlooked, not least in climate change studies. And I'll give you some slightly worrying uh, results that demonstrate some of the problems of this in a moment. So we need to do that. So in this particular study, this is another, another of the models I've been involved in developing. Ooh, did it go forward, sorry. Oh, well, that's interesting. All right, come on, something Right, here we go. Okay, this is stuck. Um, so this is a model where what we're trying to do here is build uh, individual sectoral models, you know, hydrology models, agricultural models, forestry models, flooding models, etc. They're based on uh, meta-modeling. So they're reduced form versions of the original full process model. Uh, the reason we do that is to facilitate the coupling between these different sectors. We want to be able to do really rapid run times of these models to explore the scenario space and the relationships between those different um, components. So that's more or less what the model looks like. And what we're doing is we're, we're trying to model uh, for the whole of the European continental region. It's actually the EU 27 plus 2. Right. And that's the sort of thing we could do. Uh, by the way, this model, uh, just from a little side step from an educational perspective, I think it's gone into the repository. Uh, but this uh, is the website. This is available online. You can go and run this model through a user friendly interface. There's a whole range of uh, sliders and checkboxes that you can implement your own scenarios and, and run those models yourselves. You may not, most of you must be interested in Europe, but just go have a play anyway if you want to, because it's quite good fun. You get some interesting results there. All right, here's, here's the impact on the biodiversity index, winners and losers across Europe due to climate change and other social economic changes, just an example. But what I really want to show you is this, and this is quite difficult to understand, but so let me just, just listen to me, don't worry about the table, and I'll tell you really what I'm, I'm trying to illustrate here with, with some of these data. 
What we did in this study was try to explore how important is it to consider the indirect effects of things like climate change and other socioeconomic change drivers. How important is it? Right? As I said earlier, we know that agriculture uh, affects water resources and vice versa, and biodiversity. So how important are those indirect effects compared with the direct effects of, say, climate change or changes in the economy? And that's the study we wanted to do. So what we did with our integrated model is we ran each of the single sets of models as standalone models. Before that, we referenced that against uh, the report, the, the Cliff Assessment Report of the IPCC, to ensure that our single sets of models are consistent, but benchmarked against the literature sources that are out there, which they were. Take it from the other They're good. They're a good match. Then we started running our models as standalone models for the same scenarios, and as a coupled model system where we're looking at the indirect effects. And this is some of the results we got. What this shows uh, is the just in, in simple terms, whether across the whole map of Europe, all the pixels that we're modeling, how many of those gave the same values in a single set of models or in the integrated model. And what you can see is the different types of uh, indicators that we're outputting here, there are different levels of concurrence or agreement between the single sector and the integrated sector. If you look at things like food provision, arable land or food provision, across a range of different um, emission scenarios, a range of different uh, GCMs we used as well, you can see that actually there's only about 20% of the of this area of Europe actually have similar values between the two modeling components. That changes as you go to different types of indicators. You have to keep in mind that the indicators of the sectors are incredibly important. But some of those changes are really significant. And this is difficult for you to understand as well. I haven't got so much time to explain this. But just look at, look at the arrows, right? Look at that. It says 50% change, right? That's what we need to know. And you can see that a lot of these ups and downs arrows, again, this is comparing across the minimum maximum values, changing the range, etc. across these different variables, how different the single set and the integrated model were. And the result is they are very, very different. They are completely different. What's significant about that is that if you look in the IPCC Working Group 2 Assessment Reports and Impacts and Adaptation, 99% of the reported studies will be based, with using models, will be based on single sector models. It will be based on hydrology models, agricultural models, etc. And what we find from this study is those assessments are either going to very strongly over or very strongly underestimate the impacts of climate change. And that's quite a worrying issue. Jay, you said that. How many things did you have up there? Four. Oh, okay. Right. How do you go? Right. Okay. So I'm going to go down to again. We're now down to the national level, and I'm just going to this may work. Just going to click on this and just quickly explain it to you. When we get down to the uh, is there an IT person in the house? Oh, it's funny, it's good. Oh, it's funny, it's just like, I've got the glasses on, I couldn't see. But, uh, it's funny, okay. Once we get down to the local level, we can use completely different paradigms of how we model uh, land use and land cover change in this example. So what you're seeing here, this is, um, this is Great Britain, small island off the coast of Europe, for those of you who don't know where it is. Um, and what you're seeing here, this is the uh, simulation through time into the future of the, of the uptake by farmers of two bioenergy crops. So this is actually quite important for climate mitigation. So I think that's climate change. Yeah? So it's really important for climate mitigation. So we've got miscanthus and short rotation crops there. Uh, what you want to see, the red dots, are the co-evolution of uh, production plants, the so way you burn the stuff to produce energy. The two need to go together. This is based on um, understanding of the individual processes that underpin decisions by individual farmers about whether they uptake this crop or not. The UK government, as part of its climate mitigation strategy, is providing large subsidies to farmers to encourage them to grow bioenergy crops. Okay? So they've got big interest in doing this. What you might have seen, if you're watching the, um, the video here, it's just a, a video of an outcome from the model run, is you get this, actually, what is a spatial diffusion process that occurs within the simulations. And this one is really useful in helping us understand how farmers are uptaking knowledge about these novel crops to them, this is novel, and implementing them or not. And what we find is, if you look at the black curve in this case, this black curve is the uptake by farmers of, this, um, of these particular crops as simulated. And what you can see is you get something like, it's almost 20 years before you get full uptake. 
That's really significant. And it's all about the exchange of knowledge between individual farmers, which influences their risk profile and how they think about risk of a novel crop. And it's literally a physical process. You see this through the landscape. You don't have to believe my model that did this, because actually the red curve is observational data for a uh, crop which in the UK we call oilseed rape. Did I think it's called or something like that? Anyone know what oilseed rape is here? Yellow flowers used for oilseed. What is it? Canola. Okay, that's the one. Yeah, Canola's French, that's right. Canola. Uh, so this is observational from data from the 1980s when the crops were introduced. Farmers took this crop up. And actually, what you see, I mean, we just have to rebase this just to give you an idea. Uh, these are two different crops, but what you see is the same pattern of uptake, but it takes, look at the red curve, something like 20 years before you actually have an uptake of this particular crop. The UK government, I mean, this is a bit of a disaster, really, because they think, oh, this farm has a large amount of money, and we'll have lots of climate mitigation through bioenergy. <laughs> Not really, it's 20 years before you really get that, so you're completely overestimating your capacity to mitigate climate change with, with this particular individual strategy. So understanding the social interactions between individual people is really important in these types of lessons. Right, I'm going to go a little bit quick now. Uh, I'm going to switch over to uh, Sweden now, and we're going to look at another agent-based model. And again, I just want to make some points here. This is an agent-based model which was being, uh, which has been developed for the forest sector in Sweden. Trees are quite important in Sweden, if you've ever been there. But we do have a little bit of agriculture on the side. And what we've been doing is working with uh, social scientists who are engaged in doing social surveys, so we can parameterize agent-based models of decision-making about uh, which type of agents are located where and what types of trees do they grow and what, for what purpose, what are they trying to generate as outcomes. And this is what we can model through time. Well, I just thought I'm going to click through this because I don't have much time. Um, so again, this just shows the simulation outcomes. So we're looking actually in this case of, of the ecosystem services, which are provided through the different land uses by different um, agents. Just to give you uh, just a quick heads up on this one, you can see there's a bit of a peak. This is pine timber production. This is going forward in time, and it looks a bit bizarre, doesn't it? But it's completely, completely okay. This is really quite easy to understand. This is a legacy effect of planting a forest in Sweden 50 or 60 years previously. They just all come to maturity at the same time. Okay, so sometimes we can actually understand a lot about the future just by not knowing what's going on in the past. So that's an important point. I want to show you this one because you will never understand what's going on here. And I want you to feel and enjoy the randomness, the apparent randomness of what's going on in these curves. And what this is showing, we've got this index of what we call coping ability for individual agents. So we have agents who are productionists, agents who are recreationalists. They have different objectives, different attitudes, different ways of interacting with one another. They can collaborate, they can compete, they can do all sorts of things. But what, this, what these graphs show is through time, the relative coping ability of those individual agents within the system changes. Right? And this is really significant because we're thinking here in terms of how will people adapt to climate change. That's the initial question that we oppose with this particular study. And the issue here is you can see that actually their coping uh, ability changes all the time. There's this sense that uh, adaptive capacity of individuals is some sort of inherent trait that we all have. You know, we can do it. Yeah, I've got lots of money, you know, I'm quite bright, so I can adapt. No problem. What this is showing is that it doesn't, that your ability to adapt to a changing environment is not just a function of your innate ability and the changing drivers as well. It's also your relationships with other individuals, other actors in the system. So that means the coping capacity is contextual on your relationship with others within society. So at various moments in time, you are better or less able to compare, to compete relative to other agents within the system simply because of those interaction processes of collaboration and competition. So it's not a static process. Adapt adaptation is dynamic. And we need to understand the human dimension processes to understand how that's going to unfold. Right, ways forward, uh, the next generation, I'm going to uh, I saved a slide at the end, which is a plug for system, so I know I'll get an extra minute or so to explain that one, so I can use my full time. And ways forward. Ways forward. We need to, we need to, to match across those different scales. We, need, we, we know at the, at the global level, we've got pretty poor representations of, of global human processes. They're not really doing a good job, as we can see from those comparisons. We know at the local level, we've got lots of interesting knowledge and information, theory, processes represented, but there's a complete mismatch across those scales. So we need ways of better developing understanding of how we can use the theorizing process representation at those local levels based on individuals and knowledge of how those individuals operate within society.
society to upscale that to larger geographic extents. That's one of the ambitions we have within the human dimensions FRG in systems. So if anyone's interested in this, please uh, engage with us. It's really just trying to improve theory, knowledge, process, and being able to upscale to global levels because we know from a political and also scientific perspective, it's really important to understand global scale changes in human systems. And this is just one way we've, we've been thinking about doing it. Um, you're familiar. Um, with the notion of some of your plant functional types, which are used in uh, global vegetation models as a way of, of um, simplifying and upscaling from sand based models up to global scale models. Well, we're working on that notion of agent functional types, where we can begin to categorize individuals according to their cognitive processes, the ways in which they use capital space, and the ways in which they interact with society. And that could be a basis, it's very theoretical at the moment, as a paper on climate change describing it, but that's the way forward that we're trying to develop. Uh, these, this way of thinking. And, my last slide, um, that's what we're going to be doing here. So next week, some of you here will be involved in this, which is great. Um, what we're going to be doing is hosting uh, a meeting here in this building next week on linking your system dynamics and social system modeling. And the whole point about this is to tackle this mismatch between how we understand human processes across scales and across sectors and think of the next generation of human dimension models that can be implemented to go beyond our capacity to model human environment interactions at present. And I will just leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, yeah, really good question. So, um, again, this is part of the mismatch cross scales. So, if you work at a local level, you can work with collecting social information from individual people, social surveys. You can test those processes in practice empirically. You can also build models to do experiments. And actually, of course, the other tricky thing with working with human dimensions is we can't do experiments with people, you know, other than other than within models. So you can't get people and put them on a an island somewhere and see how they interact. You have to, you have to, yeah, well, people like, I'd like to do that. It would be great fun. But uh, unfortunately, the ethics committee in my university wouldn't be too pleased if I started doing that. So, so we do need the models to start doing experiments and testing again against data. And that's where it really all falls down at the global level, because you just cannot do that. Apart from anything, you don't have global scale data sets that will give you that information. A little um, sort of longer term ambition of mine, which I would love to see, is if we could actually initiate a global scale um, repository of social sciences information based on the hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions, I don't know, uh, case studies that people do in anthropology, sociology, all over the world. Um, there's a similar thing done actually with a vegetation modeling community. They're building trait databases to try and parameterize plant functional types. But why do we bring together case studies in human dimensions work where we can parameterize agent functional types and use that to build models? So, yeah. This is really one of the top ten the world. So we like to a lot. We just have a lot. We just have a lot. We just what component would comfortably fit in a program which included these individuals? Oh, sorry, which individuals? The which individuals? With the individuals, with the philosophers. Right. Um, they are, I should say, part of a broader community. Actually, no, let me qualify that. They, they have an important role to play. And so I think one of the points I was making here is that actually 
uh, we do need better theorizing about how human systems operate. Right? We, just don't, we have theories, they're mostly economic theories, and we know that they're all wrong. Right? So we need to do better. And, and actually, a more philosophical um, approach, often maybe a more psychologically based approach as well, is probably really important here. And there are people engaged in this type of work across communities, but I'd say there isn't really a community but that comes together across these, dis these different disciplines that can actually take the work forward at the moment. And I think that's why, frankly, human dimensions analysis and modeling is way behind many facets of, of the physics of the Earth system. And I think it's, it's also because a lot of you know, philosophers, if you tell a philosopher you're a modeler, they think you're the Antichrist. You know, they just do not accept that modeling is, uh, is a, a way forward. So, yeah, so we, have to, we have to work on them for that. But, uh, and there's lots of challenges in doing that. But, but the other point, just to kind of take a bit more time here, the other thing I think is really useful, uh, I think you've made some talks about this, but anyway, the other thing um, is really interesting is how you use these models, uh, how you confront these models with real people, right? And sometimes it's fun to confront the model people with real people. That's quite fun. We run a lot. We do a lot of participatory uh, studies um, in my team, where we are running models up in real time, and so we pass run over uh, turnover times uh, with state decision makers. And in our case, we've done studies, workshops in, in Scotland with Scottish government officials to understand their responses to some of the model changes that we're observing. And it's the basis of a discourse to analyze what's going on. We're not saying that the model is the best prediction of how the future world will be in Scotland or anywhere else for that matter, but what we're saying is these are plausible future projections that come out of these models that we can form the basis of a discussion. One example of that is the Scottish Government is currently interested in reforesting the whole of the surface area of Scotland by 25% of the surface area, part of its climate mitigation targets. Right? We had a great workshop with Scottish Government officials saying, yeah, you can do that. You know, here's the model runs, let's show them that. So 25% of Scotland is now covered in trees. That's just what you want. Oh, by the way, Scott's mentioned that you have to increase your food imports by 10%. And everyone has to move over to a vegan diet. Right? That's the only way you can achieve that, right? because there are trade-offs in land use. You know, if you want to plant trees, you can't grow animals. So I'm, I'm like, oh my gosh, oh, wow, wow, that's that's unusual. What happened there? And it's, no more cheese, exactly. And it's not, and it's not, it's, um, it's not that the ten percent of food imports is important as a predictive value. It's just saying actually you will need to increase. In, increase Imports. Yeah, I'll shut up. <laughs>